A guide to growing pole beans. A climbing vine type, pole beans are said to be even tastier than bush beans. They have a sweeter, starchier flavor and a longer harvest window. Pole bean varieties. Flat. These varieties are wide Romano-like and have a rich and sweet flavor. Its pods are stringless and tender. Round. Long, slender beans that can grow to either 7 inches, 18 centimeters as fillet beans, or to 11 inches, 28 centimeters. In both cases, the bean pods stay stringless and tender. Yard longs. These heat-loving varieties need to be cooked to taste good. They have a sweet flavor and can be 16 to 20 inches, 40 to 50 centimeters long. Treating seeds with inoculants before sowing them increases their chances for growing success. Simply roll the seeds in the granular bacteria, which can be found online or at the local garden center, and then set them into the soil. Pole bean's ideal soil temperature for germination is between 70 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 to 29 degrees Celsius, and typically they germinate poorly in temperatures that are below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius. Plant bean seeds 1 inch, 2.5 centimeters deep, in hills with 4 to 6 seeds around the support structures that are going to be used for the bean plants. If seeding along trellises, plant the beans 3 inches, 7.6 centimeters apart. The rows should then be about 3 to 4 feet, 0.9 to 1.2 meters apart. It's also best to set the seeds on both sides of the fence or trellis. Pole beans grow best in full sun, but they can also tolerate some partial shade. Pole beans will thrive in a soil that has a pH between 6.0 to 6.8. Bean plants also need even moisture, especially when flowering and developing their pods. Drought stress will reduce the bean plant's yield, but it's also important to avoid wetting the leaves or touching wet leaves, since both can encourage disease growth. It's important to note that the pod development won't be good when air temperatures are higher than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. And if the plants get too crowded around a pole or along a trellis, thin them to 6 inches, 15.2 centimeters apart. This allows for more air circulation and helps their leaves dry faster, again, avoiding disease. Fertilizer. Work some all-purpose fertilizer into the soil before planting. Other than that, beans generally don't need any extra fertilizer. Since they naturally fix nitrogen in the soil, any added nitrogen promotes their leaf growth but reduces their pod production. Mulching. Grass clippings, wood chips, or straw can be applied to retain moisture in the soil after the second set of true leaves have developed. This also helps suppress weeds that would otherwise compete for nutrients and water with the bean plants. Brassicas, carrots, celery, Swiss chard, corn, cucumber, eggplant, potatoes, radish, and strawberries are all great companions for beans. That's because beans fix nitrogen in the soil, which is beneficial to many plants and especially to heavy feeders. Chives, leeks, garlic, onion should all be avoided with beans. Members of the onion family are typically harmful for the rhizobia bacteria that fix nitrogen in the soil with pole beans. As well, beets and beans will stunt each other's growth, so they shouldn't be planted too closely together. Finally, sunflowers and fennels should also be avoided near pole beans. Pole beans need a 5 to 8 feet, 1.5 to 2.4 meter tall support structure, since they can reach over 9 feet, 2.7 meters in height. Carefully attach the plants with twine to the structures as soon as they're tall and mature enough. Try not to pull the twine too tightly because it can end up damaging the bean plant. Here are some tall support options. Trellis, crisscross. 
This trellis looks like a series of A's joined by a crossbar. Vertical. To make this trellis, stretch a wire horizontally between poles both on the top and the bottom. Then attach pieces of twine or strong string vertically between the top and bottom wires. TP. This is a traditional four pole method. Poles should be about 12 feet, 3.6 meters long. Then they can be twined together at the top so that it creates a TP shaped structure. Single pole. With this option, one strong pole is placed in the middle of a row so that one to two plants can grow alongside it. Wire fence. If one is already available, then this makes for a great support option. Note, do not place these structures where beans could shade any plants that need full sun. Containers. The larger and deeper the pot, the more space it has to retain moisture. This also means that the bean plants won't need to be watered as frequently. These pots slash containers should have a minimum soil depth of eight to nine inches, 20 to 23 centimeters, and they should also be put in a spot that gets enough sun exposure. Raised bed. The soil in raised beds drains well and warms up faster, both of which help reduce the risk of disease infections. It also protects plants from getting disturbed by foot traffic. Open field. Open fields usually provide the most space and the best chances to install trellises. First though, check the soil for its fertilizer requirements and possible diseases left over from the last harvest. Typically, open garden fields don't need to be watered as often as container plantings. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Leaf hoppers. These tiny wedge-shaped light-colored green or gray insects suck the plant's juices. They can stunt a plant's growth, cause leaves to become spotted, and leaf hoppers also carry and spread many diseases. Here's what to do. Crop rotation weed control, cover crop planting, and companion planting are all important ways to help lower the risk of damage done by pests. The use of row cover slash insect netting can also help to control leaf hoppers. As well, insect soaps and neem products are both effective ways to prevent and eliminate a leaf hopper infestation. Mexican bean beetle. These are copper brown pests with black spots that look like large ladybugs. 
They feed on leaves, which creates irregular patches of damage on the undersides of these leaves. That damage then causes the top surface of the leaf to dry out. This will give a plant's leaves a lacy appearance. These insects can also damage flowers and small pods, which can be damaged so badly that they drop from the plant entirely. Also, sometimes these beetles can reduce the yield of crops. Here's what to do. Since damage is most severe during the summer months, consider planting early maturing bean varieties to avoid the issue. If these beetles are found on any plants, both the adults and immature beetles can be hand-picked from the plants. Also, be sure to remove the bright yellow eggs that are typically laid in clusters on the undersides of leaves. Another option to use is diametaceous earth, which contains no toxic poisons and works quickly on contact. It's a natural powdery substance made from the skeletons of tiny aquatic creatures. Simply dust this diametaceous earth lightly and evenly over the crop, wherever the beetles are found. Finally, if the beetle infestation is heavy, insecticidal soaps can be applied to the leaf undersides. Seed Corn Maggot These maggots are yellowish-white in color, with a pointed head and no legs. They attack either the seeds or the roots of a plant, and are often attracted to seeds when they have already been affected by diseases or insects. When seeds are attacked by seed corn maggots, which is usually while the seeds are germinating, the attack keeps those seeds from growing. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties to avoid having a seed corn maggot problem. If these pests are present, then any and all infected seedlings will need to be removed and destroyed. Also, it helps to avoid using heavy compost or manure, since these substances attract the maggot flies that would lay eggs on the plant. Spider mites. These tiny spider-like pests are about the size of a grain of pepper and can be red, black, brown, or yellow in color. They feed on plants sucking on the plant juices and removing chlorophyll, which is important for a plant's ability to turn sunlight into energy. Then the mites inject toxins into the plants, which causes white dots to appear. Also, affected leaves will become dry and yellow, and those affected leaves can drop from the plant entirely. Oftentimes, there's also some webbing visible on the plant, and the plant's growth can be slowed. Typically, spider mites multiply quickly and thrive in dry and dusty conditions. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of spider mites, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Spider mites can sometimes be controlled with a forceful spray of water every other day, and it's best to spray them in the morning hours. That's because when plants are sprayed early in the day, those plants have time to dry off which avoids bacterial or fungal growth from taking place. Hot pepper wax or insecticidal soap can also get rid of spider mites. Just be mindful that certain sprays can also kill off the natural predators of spider mites. Since these natural predators, like ladybugs, are good bugs to have, they should be encouraged in the garden. Potential diseases and their solutions. Anthracnose. Small water-soaked spots will appear on a plant's leaves, and eventually those spots will get bigger and turn tan or brown in color with a papery texture. This disease thrives in extremely wet weather, and its spores are usually spread by splashing water. It can grow on any part of a plant, except for on the plant's roots. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant seeds when possible, and practice good crop rotation, in general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. As well, avoid using sprinklers or overhead irrigation and water plants from their base to keep leaves as dry as possible. As well, seeds can be treated with hot water prior to planting, 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius for 25 minutes. If anthracnose is found on any plants, 
make sure to destroy and compost the crop residue after harvest. As well, make sure to follow recommended spacing guidelines, since air circulation and ventilation is important for avoiding a lot of diseases. Finally, when planting in containers, it's important to sterilize those containers before use. Bacterial blight. A disease that causes water-soaked spots to appear on leaves. Those spots will grow and turn brown while also being surrounded in yellow. And when the lesions come together, plants develop a burned appearance. At this point, any leaves that die will remain attached to the plant. Bacterial blight will also stunt the growth of plants and it can be spread by water, wind, animals, or people. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-free seeds when possible and practice good crop rotation. Use drip watering methods or any watering method that focuses on only watering the base of the plant. Avoid splashing water onto plants and make sure the plant leaves are kept nice and dry. As well, ensure good ventilation and air movement by spacing plants properly. This will also help reduce any humidity around those plants. It's also important to control the growth of any nearby weeds. Another thing that can be done to avoid disease is to treat seeds with an antibiotic before planting to kill off the bacteria. Finally, spray plants with a protective copper-based fungicide before any disease symptoms appear. Bean Common Mosaic Virus This virus causes lesions to form on the leaves of a plant, and it will also cause the plant's roots to blacken. Bean Common Mosaic Virus is either seed-borne or spread by aphids. If the entire plant becomes infected, the entire yield can be lost. Here's what to do. Remove and destroy any infected plants, as well as the surrounding soil. Make sure to also control aphid populations on the plants to prevent the aphids' ability to spread the virus. It also helps to plant resistant varieties like Lancer, Provider, Blue Bush 274, Golden Butterwax, Royal Burgundy, Tender Crop, and Improved Tender Green. Bean Rust. Initially, small yellow slash white spots will appear on the leaves of a plant. Those spots will then grow and develop raised red rust pustules, which are gross pimple-like growths. If the disease is severe, it can cause plants to drop their leaves prematurely. Here's what to do. Water beans in the early morning hours to give plants time to dry out during the day. Drip watering and soaker hoses can also be used to help keep leaves dry, but overhead sprinklers should be avoided. As well, use a slow-release organic fertilizer on crops and avoid excess nitrogen. Prune or stake plants and remove any weeds to improve the air circulation around the plants. Make sure to disinfect any pruning tools, one part bleach to four parts water, after each cut. Finally, Use a thick layer of mulch or organic compost to cover the soil after the soil has been raked and cleaned, because mulch will prevent the bean rust disease spores from splashing back up onto the plant's leaves. Harvesting. Pole beans are always climbing, so typically there are always pods in different maturity stages on the plant. Keep picking them, otherwise the plant will stop producing new pods once they've all matured. The smaller the bean, the more tender it is. Note, bean plants take nitrogen from the air and store it along their roots in the soil. When those roots are left in the ground after harvest rather than pulled out, they can be worked into next year's soil and will release their nitrogen. That way, next year's crop will benefit from the already existing nitrogen. Brassicas, like broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower, tend to be a great follower after beans since they need plenty of nitrogen to thrive. Storage. Pole beans can be stored at temperatures around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, for about a week. For longer storage, beans can be briefly blanched in boiling water. 
That short period of heat will kill off any pesky enzymes, which are notorious for reducing nutrients and causing the beans to break down in storage. After that, simply dry and freeze them. Then all that's left to do is enjoy these tasty pole beans.